Welcome, everybody, to today's session on Turn on Federalism on Intergovernmental Relations in Federal Systems. My name is Soren Kyle. I'm an academic at Canterbury Christ Church University in the UK, and together with my colleague, Dr. Paul Anderson, I'm in charge of the website 50 Shades of Federalism. Please allow me to say a few words about Turn on Federalism about our partners and about today's session before I hand over to today's speaker. Turn on Federalism is a cooperation between 50 Shades of Federalism and the Hans Seidel Foundation, which is a German political foundation entrusted with a mandate from the German federal parliament. And its core mandate is to promote democracy and the rule of law within Germany um, but also worldwide with over 100 projects in more than 60 partner countries. 50 Shades of Federalism is a project that was established in October 2017 um, with the aim to foster debate on federalism. The website 50shadesoffederalism.com provides short articles on federalism which are free to download and use. The new online series, Turn on Federalism, today's event is number four in our series, brings together the Hans Seidel Foundation and 50 Shades of Federalism with the aim of enhancing the debate on federalism globally. The, a, the series aims to engage with experts, politicians, and civil society actors around the world and to discuss the possibilities of federalism in different shades and country-based evolutions, as well as to create further networks of exchange, discussion, and cooperation. Our topic today focuses on intergovernmental relations. These are often key in order to explain why federations work. As today's speaker, Professor Joanne Poirier will point out, uh, intergovernmental relations are often challenging to study because they often bring together formal processes, but also informal practices. Indeed, the head of the conference of Swiss cantons, when I asked him about intergovernmental relations, uh, once said to me, well, they usually involve emails, phone calls and chats which is interesting, but particularly challenging to study. So today we ask the question, why do these intergovernmental relations matter so much? And what can we learn from mature federal systems, especially also for emerging federations? Many of our participants today come from countries where we are seeing emerging federal structures. Before I hand over to today's speakers, please allow me to introduce our, our panelists today. Uh, those of you who have joined us before will know that the wonderful Anja Richter will be our moderator today. Uh, Anja is the head of the Hans Seidel Foundation office in London uh, in the United Kingdom. Today's speaker is Professor Joanne Poirier. Uh, she teaches at uh, McGill University's Faculty of Law in Montreal, Canada, where she holds the Peter McCall Chair in Federalism. We are very, very pleased to have both of them here with us. Before I hand over to Joanne, please let me remind you, if you have any questions for our speaker, please use the Q&A box. We will collect all the questions and pass them on to Professor Poirier. Please feel free to listen to us either on this channel in English or to select the Myanmar channel in the uh, language button in your Zoom menu and follow the discussion in Myanmar language. I will now hand over to Professor Poirier. Thank you very much. <laughs> 
hi, am I on screen? It, I just want to be sure I get a good platform. Excellent. Um, bonjour, uh, good morning. Mingalakbar, uh, I hope I pronounced this somewhat correctly. Uh, it's a real privilege to participate in this seminar today with, uh, with people I understand from around the world. So it's a very humbling experience. Thank you for joining me at probably ungodly hours uh, around the globe. Some of you should be probably sleeping. For me, it's very early in the morning. It's also absolutely beautiful right now uh, near Montreal where I am. It has snowed overnight. And for some of you, it probably is unthinkable that we love to live in a country where it's minus 20 uh, outside. Uh, I'd, I'd like to thank the, uh, the foundation, the Hans Seidel Foundation for, for inviting me uh, and the, the leaders of Fifty Shades of Federalism, uh, both really interesting uh, initiatives to bring discussion about federal systems into a broader community than, uh, than academic specialists. And it's really uh, a, an important learning experience for, for all of us, including uh, certainly the speakers. Um, before I start, I would like to acknowledge that I am speaking today. I'm in Canada, in Quebec, which for many of you will know is the French speaking part, mostly French speaking part of, of Canada. Uh, but I am speaking from unceded land of uh, an indigenous people called the Abenaki, part of the Anishinaabe Nation. And I would like to thank the indigenous peoples on, on whose land we are grounded uh, today. Um, I have about 12 minutes to speak and I would like to speak to you about 50 shades of IGR. So this will be quite difficult. So I will speed through some of it. And of course we can go back to elements uh, during the, uh, the discussion uh, period. So let's go. Um, basically, th this talk is based on the Fifty Shades of, of Federalism uh, article that uh, I contributed to the project, in which I use big words a little bit, um, saying that intergovernmental relations are ubiquitous, meaning they're everywhere. They're idiosyncratic, meaning that they're very specific to each system, despite the fact that there are common trends. Uh, they are often opaque, which means that they're difficult, as Soren uh, underlined, very difficult sometimes to, to access, to understand, but we know they're there, uh, so we keep digging. Um, and of course, they're, they're quite essential, they're just inescapable. So on the menu, a few questions. What are RGI? Why? Who does? Who's involved? How? And how so? What's the consequence of some of it? So what they are... Oh, Sorry, I wrote RG, so it should be RGR. Um, intergovernmental relations are, can be described in all sorts of fashions and, and political scientists sometimes uh, use more ter terminology of international relations to talk about them. But I will have a, a more limited description, if you will. Um, I'm talking about mechanisms and instruments or institutions through which partners in a federation or another kind of decentralized multi-level governance structure uh, enter into relation. So while uh, entering or partaking in intergovernmental relations is an exercise of self-rule, you do it through your autonomy, you do it through your own powers, if you have powers in a federal system, um, but it actually is an exercise of joint rule. It's a way of acting together. And of course, the balance between self-rule and joint rule is the destiny of, of federalism, the definition and the destiny. Uh, why IGR? Well, they are basically inevitable because of the dispersion of authority and the policy um, responsibilities in a, a, and I will say federal system. Uh, and, and that's a positive thing. You basically have a federal system to you know, for all sorts of reasons you've explored in other contexts, uh, but basically you divide responsibilities and powers between different orders of government. Uh, but policy has this way of not respecting borders all the time, so that interaction is inevitable and probably increasing. So there's always this tension between saying, okay, you get autonomy, for instance, you can run your own schools, but there might be elements where interconnection and interdependence need to be taken into account, either for funding or to give you an example, because 
although you run your own education system, it might be that only one of your regions or one of the regions or several of the regions of the country can actually have a very technical engineering faculty. And therefore, students need to be able to travel and get degrees. So you need to interconnect to do that. But sometimes it will be done for all sorts of other policies. So basically, IGR are ways of clarifying who should do what and how it's done. Of course, who should do what in a federal system? The blueprint will be in the Constitution. It will be the division of powers. But the division of powers can never be specific enough to really see how things are done on the ground. And even when they're specific, there can be interactions. So you can actually say, you do this, we do that in the constitution. But actually, when you start implementing your policies or developing them, you realize that there's overlap or uh, interference with other orders of government. So it, IGRs will be ways of managing this interconnection, sharing information, making joint decisions, co-managing resources. if you know, two regions or uh, straddle a body of water, for instance, um, structure redistribution, fiscal federalism, because of course autonomy in a federal system means nothing if you don't have the funds to actually act upon your autonomy. So you need to structure how money and resources will be redistributed. Um, there are ways of sometimes renting services from another order of government. So there are all sorts of reasons why we need this and why IGR are uh, essential. Who's involved? Um, official actors of the Federation, and by this I mean the federal authorities and the provinces, state regions, or sometimes the municipalities, the actors that are actually recognized in the Constitution and hold powers and the division of powers. Um, but there are also, and, and this is an important trend, increasing other actors who enter into intergovernmental relations. Sometimes they're formally recognized in some constitutions, sometimes they're not. And I'm thinking here of different types of minorities. If minorities don't actually sort of control a region, they don't necessarily have a power structure in the federal system, but it doesn't mean that they're not involved in, um, in, in developing policies, in sharing information, in being taken into account and so on. Indigenous peoples, sometimes municipalities, if they are not recognized as formal actors. We've even seen sometimes industry involved in IGR. Uh, in Nigeria, from, for instance, the uh, oil industry sometimes participates in government um, uh, meetings, uh, intergovernmental meetings. I'm not judging whether this is a good or bad thing. I'm just saying it's a sort of a descriptive uh, uh, element. Um, I put army with a question mark because, of course, in some parts of the world, this might be an element to what extent um, power holders or important actors are involved uh, in, in, uh, in, in these networks of intergovernmental relations. Civil society, um, it's a challenge. And this is where we need a lot of institutional creativity to be sure that the public is involved in these networks as well. Um, these relations can be vertical, so federal order of government with the units. And when I say vertical, it's sort of a descriptive term. I don't mean it in a, a normative way. I don't mean that the federal government's above the regions. Uh, in, in most federal systems, they are understood to be equals, but it sort of describes, um, you know, it, it's a catchphrase, if you will, sort of federal and constitutive units. Sometimes it's between the units themselves, we call this more horizontal. It can be multilateral, lots of units. Sometimes we say omnilateral, meaning everybody's involved. Sometimes it's bilateral. So it will be between two units or between the federal order and one particular region um, or several of the regions, but all in parallel. This can generate asymmetrical arrangements. Uh, so these, these are very flexible. And again, it makes it difficult sometimes to assess what's going on, but it's actually really important. It's the sort of the lifeblood of, of federalism. I also put unilateral, and that's pretty weird, isn't it? That in a network, you'd have unilateral action, but sometimes unilateral action can be positive or negative. Imagine that you're the federal authority and you have absolute, in theory, um, uh, exclusive power over um, let's say, um, environmental protection, to say something. But you still need to engage with local authorities to deliver, to, to 
to educate, to police violations and so on, you might actually unilaterally decide to invite participation from units. Of course, once participation is going, that it's no longer unilateral, but the initiative is unilateral. States, of course, of course, Egypt isn't federal, but states and federations are generally thought through, you know, and I'm a constitutional lawyer, some of you probably see that states are seen as pyramidal kind of structures or, or concepts with you know authority at the begin at the top and then it straddles down and then legitimacy coming from the people and moving into the institutions and if you have a federal system you might have different types of pyramids and they might be related intergovernmental relations are networks so they work through these formal structures but they create connection and these connections can be positive or uh, or negative factors that influence igr i said earlier that they're idiosyncratic meaning they can they get to be very context dependent and context specific and i will not go through all of them you can read them um, but all of these elements and more are relevant to how these networks develop and work uh, some of them will be structural like do you have a presidential system or a parliamentary system how many units do you have it's the relationship if you've got 50 units like in the united states or if you've got six plus in australia is quite different of course um sometimes it will be more cultural what kind of political culture is there is a political culture of compromise legal culture do you like to write things down in constitutions and informal texts or do you think do things more pragmatically these will all be elements that will affect uh intergovernmental relations Relations can be collaborative. That's what we're sort of hoping for, but sometimes they're very conflictual. And sometimes they can even be coercive, meaning despite even official equality between partners, it might be that one partner is more equal than others, uh, has more power, more money, and can basically either force other parts of the country of the Federation to act according to its priorities, or can induce it through uh, what we call the spending power. If you've got money, sometimes you can convince others to do things um, by offering money uh, for, for that policy objective. IGR can be egalitarian, they can be hierarchical, you know, when I just said coercitive, they can be asymmetrical, as I said, particularly if you have regions with a special a status, a special identity, um, you know, to take my country in, in Canada, Canada has 10, 10 provinces and three territories. Historically, there's been a special arrangements, although not formally recognized really in the constitution. Um, are you showing me something, sir? Oh, sorry. Um, um, but, but there's been special arrangements to, with Quebec because Quebec has the majority of the French speaking minority in, in Canada. As Søren said, formal and informal, this is a scale, and you will have countries where IGR mechanisms and structures and institutions are more formalized and some of them where they're less formalized, but everywhere, even when you've got the textbook formalized arrangements, you still have the informal, the unpredictable, the personal, the phone calls, the, it used to be the meetings and so on. And this can be really positive, but of course it can be pretty problematic because it can lead to old boys network you know people who meet all the time will know each other will be able to solve things and that might be effective but it also means that it leaves other people out so having formalized institutions is sometimes a way of ensuring broader uh, participation igr well there's a toolbox and i will not go through all the possible uh tools that you could use um, because I don't have time, but um, some include legislative instruments. Um, so, you know, second chambers, if they work well, obviously are the archetypical means of um, joint rule and participation. So this is a very formalized element. Some would put them in intergovernmental relations, some would not. But anyway, it's, a, it's just an archetypical example of where 
cooperation can, can occur, or at least participation of units in central decision making. Uh, but it can also be through executive elements, composition of the federal cabinet, for instance, if it draws from uh, every region and every minority and so on. Uh, sometimes you have parliamentary collaboration and techniques, so you, all sorts of ways of drafting legislation that can take other orders of government into consideration, saying, I will draft a general legislation with objectives, and then the units can adopt further legislation or regulations to detail it, or they can implement it. Sometimes you'll have model legislation saying, okay, we're all independently responsible for to take again the example of education, but it might be a good idea to have a model law about access to education or about the school year or about you know, certain aspects of, of the curriculum. And everybody can choose voluntarily to adopt that model and it will be, you know, it will draw some harmonization. You can do it through the civil service, but different models here. Typically, in some many fe federal systems, which we call dualist, the civil service will be independent in each order. But in some countries, there's quite a lot of exchanges. And India has a very interesting notion or concept or tradition uh, of having a national civil service where um, people are trained together and then sent to all the different regions and there's rotation. So people get to know other parts of the country and that facilitates intergovernmental relations. You can create agencies, you can conclude intergovernmental uh, agreements, which are sort of formal or informal written down arrangements for all the other things that we've talked about. I will skip these very briefly because they're just further examples of IGR in the legislative branch, executive agreements, and umbrella bodies that actually are meant to organize intergovernmental relations. Sometimes that happens, you know, and I put we've put a bit of emphasis on what's not really visible, but sometimes in some countries you have like a, a department in charge of intergovernmental relations, or you have a body within each order of government, often in the you know, maybe in the premier's office or the president's office that will be in charge and sort of akin to foreign affairs. You know, if you think about the importance of foreign relations, inter international relations, well, within a federal country, you have that kind of diplomacy as well. And the more you have a structured body with specialists, who know the business, uh, know the ropes, know the mechanisms, well, you can hope that the system will be more effective. Uh, idiosyncratic, lots of differences, but some common elements that come through when we do uh, comparative analysis. Some of them I've mentioned. Everywhere, ubiquitous, highly executive led, even when we try to involve other order, the, the legislative branch, it is executive led and therefore that creates issues of um, uh, democratic deficit and opacity and so on. It might be more effective and flexible, but less uh, controlled. Um, we see increasing in many federations horizontal relations between orders of government as opposed to federal to constitutive units, increasing new actors, I've mentioned it. A waltz between formal and informal. So even when you have very formal structures, sometimes you've got informal de de uh, de developing and increasing in very informal intergovernmental relations. Canada is typical. We've got almost nothing written down. We're seeing now with the COVID crisis calls for more predictable, organized structures. Um, an element I haven't talked about, we can come back to it, is how IGR can sometimes circumvent the Constitution or complement the Constitution. That can be positive and that can be quite problematic. Uh, and there's, of course, the, the a problem which I've mentioned. There's a tension between efficiency, which IGR facilitates, and accountability. If it's executive-led and opaque, it's more difficult for it to be uh, um, scrutinized and accountable. I'm nearly finished. The treatment for some of these problems I've just mentioned. Well, in some cases, it's to structure IGR through law. I've, you know, framework legislation, uh, maybe enable the 
judiciary to control how relationships take place. Now that's a problem if you don't have an independent judiciary. Uh, and, and you know, this is, this is a complicated one. Um, in you know, different good practices, Spain has adopted a, a transparency law that says, okay, IGR are important, they're opaque, what are we gonna do? Well, at least you've got an obligation by law to publish certain elements. You have to publish your um, uh, agenda when there's an intergovernmental meeting. You've got to publish a certain number of things. There will be opaque and unseen things, but, but it brings it out a bit more in the open and facilitates civil society and media interaction. Generate a federal culture. Federalism is self-rule, joint rule. It's a complex, moving, fluid, challenging balance, and you need a sense with all the actors that you need some respect for autonomy and for understanding that you need participation. I will stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, merci, miigwech. Um, and I have, I'm looking forward to, to your question. Thank you for your attention. Well, merci. Thank you very much, Joanne. That was fascinating and probably a lot to take in for everyone. Sorry. To our global audience, let me also just briefly welcome you and wish you a happy new year on behalf of the Hans Seidel Foundation. It's now my great pleasure to moderate this part of the event where we get to quiz Joanne on her presentation, but also ask questions that may relate more to your various countries. I will start with just a couple of questions to get the discussion going. And while you're still thinking, although I can already see questions popping up, we have a truly global audience today from Argentina to Greenland, Morocco, Philippines, Pakistan, and of course our many friends in Myanmar. So I really look forward to all of your questions. As Zuren said, just a quick reminder, please write your questions in the Q&A box. Keep them short and sweet as you can and please refrain from comments so we can run through those questions and pose them to Joanne and hopefully get through all of them today. So Joanne, in previous seminars, you mentioned this is already number four, you said, and we've, we've discussed how people in established or newly established federal systems can become true federalists. We've looked at safeguarding mechanisms or specific constitutions, you said they can never be specific enough. And of course, political culture. How do you think IGR helps federal systems to work better, just briefly? Well, um, they work better under certain conditions, of course, because, um, because of the informal element of intergovernmental relations, and sometimes even the very formal, uh, it can be a space for power politics and, and realpolitik, you know, where you negotiate. And when you negotiate, sometimes, uh, you know, again, power matters. So sometimes it will lead to unbalance in in uh, in a federal uh, system but basically how they help to work is is by allowing sharing of information allowing participation allowing for consultation so that you don't actually act on your own in ways that can be uh, problematic or detrimental to other members of the federation and it is a, a challenge because of course the way the reason we opt for federal systems. Uh, you know, there is sort of the old federations which opted for, um, you know, to manage large territories or uh, for sort of defense military reasons or, um, you know, to, to diffuse power and prevent authoritarianism. These are all very important reasons. But the more recent federations tend to have developed in contexts in which there is a a search for accommodation of diverse groups, uh, sometimes that have been, you know, um, in, in huge tension and in conflict. And intergovernmental relations are a way of saying, or, or federalism is a way of 
empowering groups to have a certain degree of self-government um, so that minorities are empowered to make decisions for themselves and are not um, dominated by, uh, by a majority and so on and so forth. Now, if you have intergovernmental relations and that allow, despite this, to have at least channels of communication. I think these are really important, both for policymaking, and then this is what the angle I've put, uh, the accent I've put on earlier, but also, and this is something I'm really interested in and concerned with, and this is not something I really research, I'm just really interested in it, is the importance of, as you're devolving powers to bring more stability in a, in a polity, you also need to think that people need to continue knowing each other or to learn about each other. Because if you don't know about your neighbor, you might distrust your neighbor. So learning about other cultures, learning about how they're doing things, learning from others who might be experimenting in their own units with their own powers is really important. Uh, so it doesn't mean that you, ha you have your decisions taken away from you. It just means that you're sharing information and learning from each other. And this is what IGR allows to do. Just while we're talking about learning from others or units, there is just a follow-up question for asking for clarification from the audience, whether by IGR we mean relations between different states within one country or between states and another foreign country. Well, I meant within a federal country. Uh, I, I distinguish it from international relations, which would be between independent states on the world stage. Uh, but there is obviously a parallel and sometimes they interconnect because, and, and this might be going further than what you're looking for, but it's important because sometimes for a country to manage its international relations with its neighbors or with the rest of the world, they will engage domestically in intergovernmental relations because you don't want only one voice or even the dominant voice to engage with neighbors if you have a very complex polity. So sometimes you need to have that, these channels of communication and decision-making and sharing of information and taking into consideration people, you know, the different groups as interest before you engage externally. And continuing on the topic of learning from others, we've got a question on the current COVID-19 pandemic, of course, IGR and crisis situations. Are there any lessons to be learned about intergovernmental relations in the pandemic? Could you give some examples of any good or bad practices in different federal systems? I think many have been grappling with the issue whether federalist systems have been at an advantage. In Germany, we've seen the German Chancellor often being frustrated dealing with her premier uh, ministers and, and in the United States, Donald Trump often seemed sort of an open conflict with, with state governors. So could you give some examples, uh, either of good or bad practices, or if there can already be a conclusion on, on whether federal systems have fared better or, or worse? Well, obviously, this is a, a very, very difficult question. I think we'll be researching this for several decades. Um, I've, I've just participated in a comparative uh, exercise where we compare how 20 federations have handled the first six months of the pandemic. And of course, so that's sort of the first wave, more or less. Uh, and of course, things change after that first wave. Uh, and sometimes tensions that weren't there have appeared and, you know, different configurations occur. It's very hard to draw a conclusion that federations fare better or worse than unitary countries. We find examples and counter examples everywhere. Some, you know, if you, you compare, um, at, at first we compared France with Germany and said, oh, well, federalism is better. That's what the French were saying. And then after that, you, you compare it with the states and say, oh, well, maybe not. You know, so it, it, it really, again, depends on the different configurations of power in the federal system and the, the, the intergovernmental arrangements. Uh, one thing I'll say is that, you know, when we, for, to take this, the US example again, um, or even if we took Brazil, and, and, you know, I know that there are people probably from the States and, and Brazil there, so please uh, 
you know, I'm happy if you disagree with me, but sometimes we think speaking with one voice and acting with one um, sort of one leader will be better. And this is a bit what you're suggesting with, uh, uh, with Merkel's statement, you know, and, and because people in Germany trust her, and because generally she's been managing things quite well, you could think, well, it would be simpler, wouldn't it? Uh, but imagine that Bolsonaro had the final and the only voice in Brazil, uh, or that uh, President Trump had the only power to make decisions on the ground in the United States. Well, this is where you think federalism is complicated and led with, to battles, but it at least allowed different strategies to be tried at different levels um, because powers and resources were, were spread out. Now, in terms of, so that, that's just one aspect of the advantages of federalism and the disadvantage. Now, how intergovernmental bodies manage this is quite interesting. When, one of the findings we're, that, that we're learning is that even when there's quite st organized structures of intergovernmental relations, sometimes they were bypassed by something else was um, developed quite spontaneously because it was more effective. In Australia, for instance, uh, there is a very formal body of intergovernmental relations called the, the COAG, the Council of Australian Governments, and it's based, it has sort of its major office in Canberra in the federal capital and so on. Now it's seen, and I'm speaking, you know, uh, sort of quoting my, 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 my colleagues there, it's, it's hugely bureaucratized and it tends to be seen as an arm of the central government a bit more than what it was intended to be. So that when COVID occurred, they developed something else which they call the national cabinet. And, and basically all the heads of all the units and the federal government started meeting in that context without all the bureaucracy that normally is, could be quite useful. But they started using something more informal. Um, so, so we see informal structures and sometimes the, the crisis created unexpected ways of, of, of decision-making. Uh, Belgium and Switzerland are highly decentralized. And during the year, initial periods of, of COVID, they allowed the federal government to make decisions that normally they wouldn't have power to make. Uh, they collaborated in making them, but they allowed a certain amount of centralization. Um, what we saw in Canada was quite tacit cooperation, the federal government allowing the provinces to make a lot of decisions instead of making it for them, because it sort of worked and you know we could go into more, more details. What seems to be key here though, is how much preparation there was for this pandemic or for other emergencies. And that requires very effective intergovernmental cooperation at the administrative level, at the legal level, below the surface? Do you have protocols and procedures to decide how you're going to close borders, uh, share medical resources, now distribute the vaccine or access the vaccine, or buy the vaccine so that you're not fighting within the federal government about these kinds of things? Uh, when do you declare an emergency? What is an emergency? What kind of responses are you gonna take? And this in countries where there was some preparation they had anticipated it, it might be one factor where explaining why things have worked better. So would you agree that having certain maybe meeting forums or channels of communications in place, as you described it, preparing for such an emergency helps? We've got a related question, hence I'm asking, how do you foster those channels of communication or that federal culture? That, so that, for example, in a crisis or emergency, those channels are already established? It, it, it's very difficult, again, because every system is quite unique. But my, my sense is that having certain formalized structures, predictable arrangements, meetings that are uh, compulsory, well, sort of pro compulsory might be a strong word, but I mean, if, if, if all intergovernmental meetings are called at the whim of the president or, uh, or, or the prime minister um, or the chancellor, then it becomes politically 
um, sort of a political gamble whether the meetings are going to be called or not. But if they're predictable, if we say every month we're going to meet, or every two months we're going to meet, or every minister of health and every minister of uh, environmental protection or every, every minister responsible for public security, police, and so on, will have regular meetings and an annual conference or an annual report on how they share information and how they work together, uh, how they've practiced. You know, one thing I've learned by talking to civil servants, again, this didn't come out, was that uh, the public security agencies in Canada had already tested some of their reactions. Every month, they predict that there's going to be an emergency. Well, I'm a bit exaggerating, but it could be like fire, you know, forest fires, or it could be major landslides or it could be uh you know possibly an invasion or something like that and they anticipate together now it's very theoretical of course but at least it's there so you know who you're talking to you know what channels you're going to use now the downside of it is for the pandemic and i'm talking again about a very specific example we've pulled out or get were accessed uh, some of the preparation work, some of the agreements and, and protocols, not all of them because they're not all published and so on. And the organigrams, the who does what, who consults with who, at what level, is so complicated. There's like 60 bucks on a page that you think, okay, when the emergency occurs and you're on the 13th of March, 2020, do you go through this or do you not go through this? So you anticipate you discuss, but you cannot overly um, structure because then you lose flexibility. Maybe moving away a bit from emergency situations, but staying on the topic of writing things down, should intergovernmental relations be written in detail in constitutions? And can intergovernmental relations harm the division of powers between federal, the federal level and the units to a certain extent? Uh, these are really two uh, really important and, and interrelated, but different questions. Uh, on the issue of writing things down, um, now, not everyone will agree, okay? I come from, I'm a lawyer, uh, you know, I, I tend to work quite interdisciplinary way, but ways, but I, I am a lawyer. So generally you like sort of things written down. Uh, I'm also, I'm both trained in the civil law tradition and the common law tradition. Quebec has both. And I've done, you know, my post, some of my postgrad work in Europe, continental Europe, and some of it in Britain. So I, you know, I've, I've been sort of uh, affected by at least two legal traditions. And of course, in the world, there's lots more legal traditions, but the common law is much more pragmatic uh, and federations that have come out of the British empire tend to be less uh, prone to writing things down, although India might be an exception partly. Uh, and those that have come out of more of a, the continental tradition, Germany, Switzerland, Belgium, Spain, so on, or, uh, South American uh, federations to a certain extent like to write things out. So that's just, I'm not saying it's good or bad, it's just a process. Now, how much you write things down? I would say it's probably a good idea to write, pre predict, insert um, major principles of cooperation. Um, constitutions are not only contracts about who does what, but they're also aspirational documents and especially when they're drafted quite recently and then when they're drafted in a sort of post-conflict uh situation they we put a lot into them don't we in terms of how we draft them and what we think we're going to get from them sometimes it's a bit excessive and we might be too ambitious about what a constitution can do but it does that so putting in the constitution the obligation to cooperate um the federal a principle of federal loyalty or committee or cooperation is probably a good idea. I find if you're looking for a model, at least in writing, the South African constitution as a chapter, chapter three on cooperative federalism, and it, it comes way up in the constitution. And it's a signal saying, okay, we're not officially federal, but we've divided powers to a certain extent, and we need 
these different bodies to actually work together. And this is where, how we're going to do it. And this is what courts can do. And this is how, you know, what the principles are. So I would say that's a good idea. Certain institutions, why not constitutionalize intergovernmental, some intergovernmental meetings and so on and so forth. Uh, that might be a good idea. Now, not everything will get written down. If it's too strict, you might lose in flexibility. Um, the other question is about how much IGR can harm the division of powers. And that's a really important um, question because IGR can be, as I said, a, a, a forum or a mechanism or phenomen phenomenon of power politics. And if you have a division of powers, but then you have intergovernmental relations that allow for buying services from another government or for uh, imposing certain types of, of, uh, of actions, uh, for renegotiating the arrangement, saying, okay, you're in charge of health, but frankly here, we've got the money and we'd like you to do X with healthcare. Um, you're of course um, challenging uh, the, the division of powers and it might be sometimes something that could be taken to a constitutional court, but not necessarily. So it has to be checked. Uh, I think that risk that intergovernmental relations have what I had called earlier, and I skipped it, a paraconstitutional impact or function is actually there. And therefore, it needs to be as transparent as possible so that this does not happen. The, the division of powers in the Constitution must remain the blueprint. And ideally, if it doesn't quite work, because after five, 10, 20 years, you realize that frankly, giving uh, exclusive jurisdiction to one order of government under one policy is not ideal. Well, hopefully you can bring the polity together, maybe to amend the constitution to see that rather than do it in the roundabout way through only intergovernmental relations. You somewhat hinted to the, the, the possibility and in, in a bad way, of course, you can you could possibly buy your way so on that, we've got a question on financial resources and what part they play in making intergovernmental relations work. For example, if the federal or the national government level has resources to distribute. Money is so key, isn't it? Um, so that this is why fiscal federalism and redistribution is so important. And in, 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 uh, this is one aspect that Arthur Benz uh, underscored in his uh, presentation on the balance between and the tension between democracy and, and, and federalism. Uh, having just, as I said earlier, having powers but no money to exercise them uh, is actually false autonomy. So you need to have resources. You need to have predictable resources that are not distributed at the whim of only one player. Um, you, at the same time, you need to have a sense of justice, you know, and there are there are tensions in every federal country about redistribution. Um, it, it depends on a lot of different factors, it depends on how resources are, are distributed even. You know? um, again, I'll just give you an, one example, but in Canada, natural resources belong to the provinces with a few exceptions. Um, so that you know, if, if you're Alberta five years ago, you're as rich as Saudi Arabia. And of course now you're not. But what I mean is there's unbalance there and we need equalization, redistribution, and so on. Where IGR come in is how you manage that redistribution. You, re you manage it through the tax system, you manage it through transfers. Are these transfers conditional or not conditional? We'll give you money, but you must put into place these kinds of policies or we'll monitor you. And if you don't do it, we'll take the money back. Or do you actually give it unconditionally so that um, um, so that the the units can actually make autonomous decisions? Do you know do you, do you, uh, the constituted units have a sufficient tax or resource base to actually make their own decisions and so on? So this, of course, is is extremely important, and this is where uh, the opacity of intergovernmental relations can be really problematic. If on the face we're all respecting self-rule, but actually there's money wrangling intentions there. So you, I think, you know, this is probably one area, if I were to draft a new constitution where I would be very explicit about uh, redistribution and, and uh, 
uh, and the rules of the game and the institutions that proceed with uh, redistribution, creating maybe some kind of agency independent, uh, sort of independent body that can advise the governments. Talking about the rules of the game, so far, most of the examples or probably all of the examples that you have given applied to or referred to liberal democracies. But what about authoritarian countries? Um, a country like Russia has a federal structure, has a constitution. But the question is whether intergovernmental relations there might be very different from those in liberal democracies, such as you've mentioned, Australia, Canada, and others. So what's your take on that? A, I'm not a specialist in Russia. And one thing I find is that when we do case studies, specific case studies, sometimes we find uh, processes that we as external, uh, sort of observers and, and people who tend to synthesize miss. And for instance, on COVID, it happened that some of the regions actually were really productive, you know, they, they in developing vaccines and so on and so forth. So we have that vision of lack of autonomy in Russia because it's an authoritarian regime and because uh, some of the local leadership have been replaced by appointees from, you know, from, from Moscow and so on. Uh, and this is all true. But it doesn't mean that below the surface, there's not more happening. So intergovernmental relations can also somewhat allow for this, but we don't necessarily uh, see it. Now, how do we provide for rules of the game? Now, I think in terms of, you know, what's happening in Russia or in other um, non-liberal or, or, or less democratic um, systems, is more about how much federalism there is in the federation than about intergovernmental relations per se. I mean, it's a broader question. To what extent do you have this respect for self rule and joint rule uh, and, and a respect for, you know, at, before you even get to intergovernmental relations, respect for the actual constitutional bargain. Um, but it, what, it, what the question of international intergovernmental relations bring to the fore is that even if on the surface, you seem to be respecting the constitution and sometimes they're not, but sometimes they are. And you know, there's a certain concern for even amending the constitution so that it looks, what you're doing looks legitimate and legal. Uh, but if below the surface, you're putting your cronies in leadership positions, you're redistributing resources according to political preferences, uh, if you're imposing uh, certain policies, if you're negotiating, um, you know, bargaining access to services or resources uh, or even autonomy uh, for other things, then of course the intergovernmental relations network is quite on, you know, it's very unhealthy. Um, so sometimes it can be positive and sometimes it can be quite negative. Another question on the form of government and how that impact or could be influenced by intergovernmental relations. So how could IGR be different in a parliamentary or a presidential? When we've just mentioned the authoritarian uh, system. Well, again, this is a broad generalization, but in the number of factors that we need to think about when we think about IGR, that is one that comes out. And again, so what I'll say is quite um, you know, it's an oversimplification, of course, because there are different types of presidential regimes and there are different types of, you know, parliamentary regimes and the electoral system will be important in all this. Uh, but just to take sort of a very short snippet, um, and, and again, the United States, right, particularly right now, because, it, you know, it's so radical what's happening there, uh, is, is a good example, where you have a parliament, uh, a presidential system in which the Congress and the president are have each have their own legitimacy. Uh, they're elected. They have powers. Uh, you know, we say the executive when we talk of the president, but of course the president isn't only the executive. The president has normative powers, and they can be at lockerhead. It and the same can happen, of course, at the level of states, and therefore. Um, policy making 
joint decision making will tend to be possibly more conflictual. Um, in a parliamentary system, and again, it's, this is a gross generalization, but in a parliamentary system, and take, let's take the simplest one with, uh, you know, a, a first past the post kind of electoral system, majoritarian system, but even with a co coalition uh, proportional representation kind of approach. Um, the, the government gets its confidence from the elected officials, from the elected assembly and will le is less likely to act in a contradictory way. So the, so the leadership, the executive leadership and the legislature, le legislature will tend to be more aligned than they might be in a presidential system. Uh, so that intergovernmental relations will be negotiated within before you even negotiate out. And this might be quite productive, but again, it really depends on, on the system. But basically I would say the di big difference is that is the potential for conflict seems to be higher in the presidential system. I'm aware that we're nearly running out of time. There's still so many questions uh, from our audience without, which I would like to, to get in. And I'll try to group them together now. There's quite a few questions on the role of civil society. Um, so one question um, is, we're all in favour of opening up IGR processes to involve civil society and the public. Are there any instructive examples, notably in newer federations? And we've actually got a question from someone from Angola oh. saying civil society do participate in public debate, but its idea is rarely taken into consideration. So what is the reality in other countries that you might know? Now, th this is really interesting. And I would say if there are amongst the hundred and some people participating from some 25 countries today who have good examples, please send it, send them our way. You know, don't be, I am not a specialist of this. I know this is an issue and this is a problem. And that civil society and this, you know, civil society is a very broad term, of course, like let, let's talk about sort of interest groups in the positive sense, uh, minority groups, groups of women, the media, uh, you know, some political parties and so on, how did they can access this? Because intergovernmental relations can become quite a selective club. And so if, you, if you're thinking about designing intergovernmental relations at a stage where civil society still has an impact because you're drawing the constitution, make sure that it, it's built in. You think about this. Now, how can that happen? It can happen through making sure that there are public um, um, debates, that there's public consultations, that intergovernmental, I'll give you an example, intergovernmental agreements, when they're negotiated, could be made, the draft could be made public and subject to public consultations before it's actually concluded. Now, this might make it really difficult to conclude. Uh, so there is a, you know, there, there's a tension there, but, but it might be an element. Um, you know, in Switzerland, there's a sort of the reverse. Once you've got a consensus, there can be the equivalent of a referendum to actually overturn it. But let's think about it the other way around, how you actually get input uh, on, on uh, the advantages of cooperation. Uh, and I would say, let's say you've got cooperation in the, um, again, infrastructure or healthcare system across units. Uh, well, there's no reason why you shouldn't consult the medical profession, why there, you shouldn't be consulting with, uh, you know, the, the, the building profession or engineers and so on to see what advantages and challenges there can be in acting jointly. I'm sorry, it's a quite a vague answer. Uh, but, but this is, I would say, cutting edge research. This is where we need innovative institutional uh, uh, design and maybe information sharing. And this is where the old federations can learn from new ones. Indeed. Um, we've also got questions related to ethnic, can federalism solve ethnic problems? And You've explained as well that intergovernmental relations may also be used to create regional groupings to, for example, circumvent formal territorial divisions 
or give ethnic minority groups a voice. Is IGR really an effective route for them to achieve their aims if official tools of state are not on offer? It's a very, very difficult question, a really important one. So we start from the premise that in there's a federal system and we have um, minority groups, religious, ethnic, linguistic, uh, so on, who do not have the tools of power. They are not um they don't have their own unit for instance in which they can exercise majority rule and, and so on and or the minority is spread out across several units can igr help there um i would say yes in at least in theory um igr could be a means of saying well there has to be in the overall intergovernmental um body and, and, and arrangements in the country, uh, ways of creating committees, information sharing, resource sharing between, between those groups, to at least have their voice brought together to the central level and to their own units. We're experimenting now with ways, and, and, and sometimes it's quite theoretical, sometimes it starts to be implemented on the ground, uh, experimenting with ways in which minorities, which are not territorially based, can actually share decision-making power over certain things. They could share curriculum in schools. They could share certain types of resources. Um, in in self-government agreements in Canada with, you know, for indigenous peoples and nations, sometimes this happens because the the, 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 the people, although they're very, very grounded in their territory, are now living largely in cities and therefore you need to make these kinds of very creative connections and intergovernmental relations can can help that either because you bring these groups into the broader conversation with the formal actors or because they create their own networks um, and and can share information coalesce um, and 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 be better negotiators and in why not imagine that they have access to resources so that they can make policies as we're coming to an end now i'd like to bring it back to sort of the academic sphere um we've got a question from the audience whether there's a way to measure intergovernmental relations so the intensity or the degree of institutionalization the relevance of output etc are there any academic indices or similar and in that context, I would like to ask you, this is your chance for, for, for your own pitch. You've said IGR are largely understudied. So why do you think that is? And given we have quite a few academics in the audience, what is your pitch? What should future research focus on in your view? Now, uh, on the first question, I, I'm not aware of an indices of formal and informal. I'm aware of comparative analysis that will uh, try to, to pinpoint that. And then I should already say that the definition of what is formal and informal uh, differs across countries and across disciplines. What lawyers consider formal is not necessarily what political scientists or economists consider formal. So you can have a very formal process of negotiations and meetings, but it's not written down anywhere. Uh, so that some people will say, well, this is very informal. And others will say, no, it's formal because it really, you know, it, we know it happens and, and it's, and it's, you know, very diplomatic and so on. So we need to, we would need to have definitions, but we, we can, you know, we could draw a range and say, well, it tends to be more formalized in, you know, certainly to give you an example in Belgium uh, and in South Africa uh, than, than it is in, in the United States, uh, for instance. So you could, you could sort of try to put it there. And the advantage of trying to do that is that you probably find counterexamples all the time. And what is important from academic, for academics in a way is not the, getting the answer right, but just to get the questions right and to get the re research right so that you can actually shift and, and nuance. Now, in terms of doing the research, why it's understudied and where we should you know, start focusing. Um, I, I'm very puzzled by that, why it's so understudied. When you think you've got you know, you couldn't get a job as a diplomat without having studied 
from the international relations or something related. You know, there's training for international relations. It's respected as a di discipline. Um, and yet you can get into intergovernmental relations by happenstance. You learn it on the job in most cases. Uh, it's not taught in, um, in law schools in the most places. It's not taught in political science. It's not even taught in many places in public administration courses. So that in, you're learning public administration in a federal system almost as if you were in various unitary, small unitary units. There are exceptions, and I did mention uh, India because uh, you know with a more um, unified, centralized upper echelon of civil civil um, service, then then there is more of that that concern. Um, so why I think it's partly because it's opaque, partly because it's been sort of dismissed as being petty politics, and you know it's um, because it, it and it it's also quite descriptive. And in our world right now, and maybe not everywhere, but descriptive work is not valued in academia very much anymore. You know we like um, quantitative data. Uh, we, we, we like very theoretical work. And sometimes we can do that with IGR, of course. We can count how many meetings and we can count these kinds of things and so on and so forth. And we can have theories. We, we can apply game theory and so on. But we also need just to understand what's going on. And that is extremely difficult and time consuming. You need to go below the surface. You need to talk to people. They need to agree to talk to you. So it's complicated and it takes a lot of time. And, um, and I don't think it's been done enough. And I think you know the, what is coming out now, and, and one thing I've seen a little bit through COVID-19 is that I see public administrators coming to academics to try to say, can you help us understand what we've been doing and maybe anticipate what we could do better uh, in terms of IGR, because clearly what we've been doing has not been optimal. And I think that conversation with actors is really, really important. And this is not something that academics um, necessarily do enough, partly because it takes time, it takes funding. And if you've got the publish or perish pressure, uh, it, it's easier sometimes to do other types of research. Um, so, so I think there's a call for interdisciplinary valuation of IGR. Still lots to do and, and, and given we've got so many questions still still left, um, I'm, I'm sure we'll have another seminar on IGR but I'm afraid we need to conclude the discussion now as we're way over an hour already and it's getting late for many of our participants. Thank you for staying with us and apologies to those whose questions have not been answered today. But our next seminar will take place on the 9th of February at the usual time, when we will take a more country specific view again and talk about probably the most known federalist country, the United States. So join us for a very timely discussion with Professor Jared Sonnigson on the fragmentation and polarization of US federal democracy. This leaves me to thank you all for watching and participating. Please fill out the feedback forms. And thank you, Joanne, in particular, for sharing your insights. Uh, this has been fascinating. And you've, you've tried to answer many of those very complicated uh, and difficult questions in a, in a short and sweet way. But uh, I'm sure we will see you again and continue the discussion. But Thank for you. now, depending on where you're watching from, I wish you a very good night, a good morning, in your case, Joanne, or a good afternoon to everyone else. Bye-bye. Merci, Quay. Thank you.